Okay, friends, we're picking up in a new chapter today, Matthew chapter 10. And let me begin by just setting the scene and reading for you the first four verses, which tells us this. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Lebius, whose name was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who would also betray him. Now, we're ten chapters into the Gospel account, and Matthew has been unfolding his story, his account, of Jesus before us step by step. Following the introduction and his Advent story, Matthew tells us about the baptism of Jesus. And in that account, Matthew shows us Jesus accepting the task that God has commissioned him to do. Then in the account of the temptations, Matthew shows us Jesus deciding on the methods he will use to embark upon his task that God has given him. And in the Sermon of the Mount, we listen at length to the words of Jesus, to his wisdom and extensive teaching on how we as individuals might be made right with God. Then in Matthew chapter 8, in the opening part of chapter 9, we have recently seen Jesus' miraculous works of power. And then in the close of chapter 9, we see the growing opposition beginning to gather against him and his ministry. And now here at the beginning of chapter 10, we shall see Jesus choosing his disciples, his apostles. If any leader is about to embark on a great undertaking, the first thing they have to do is choose their followers. On them, in a sense, the present and maybe the future success of the work, the mission will depend. Now, particularly when we, from our standpoint, from this point of time, we know that Jesus will not be physically on earth with these people always. So that takes on even more a particular poignancy and relevance. But here, Jesus is choosing his helpers in the days of his incarnation, those who would carry out his work on earth and when he would leave the earth and return to glory with his father. And there are two facts, I would say, about these people, these men who were chosen, that should really strike us immediately. First is that they were just ordinary people. They had no wealth. They had no academic background. They had no social position. They were chosen from among very ordinary people. These 12, these men, None of them had any special education and none of them had any real social privileges or advantages. It's often been said that Jesus is looking not so much for extraordinary people, but he's looking for ordinary people through which he can do extraordinary things. Jesus chose these particular men not because of who they were or weren't, but because of what they were capable of becoming under his influence and his power. No one need ever think they have nothing to offer the Lord or the work of God because Jesus can take whatever limited abilities, anything that we're prepared to offer to him and he can do great things with it. So first they were ordinary people but secondly they were an extraordinary mixture of people. There was for instance at one end of the scale Matthew the text collector. Everyone would have regarded Matthew at that time as a traitor, someone who had sold themselves into the hands of the country's occupying force, literally dealing with the country's enemies for financial gain. However, alongside Matthew, we see he chooses someone called Simon, and Luke calls him Simon Zelotes, which means Simon the Zealot. Now, a Roman historian called Josephus described these zealots at great length in his book called Antiquities and he referred to them as the fourth party of the Jews. The other three main parties were the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the Essenes. But here he says this fourth group, the zealots, and to quote them they said they had a complete attachment to maintaining personal freedom. And they said that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. They were prepared to save death for their nation and for their beliefs. They were prepared to see their comrades or even their family members and loved ones die in their struggle for independence and freedom. 
They refused to recognize any earthly man as king. And they were also prepared to go to the length of committing murder or assassination to seek rid from their country of these foreign rulers. They were the ultra patriots of the first century, the most nationalist of all the Jewish nationalists. And the plain fact is that this Simon the Zealot has been joined into a group with someone like Matthew, the Roman tax collector. That's amazing. Anywhere else than in the company of Jesus, Simon the Zealot would probably have wanted to stuck a knife in Matthew. But the amazing truth is that people who hate each other can often learn to love and accept each other when they have both decided to love and to follow Jesus. We may also ask why Jesus chose 12 special disciples. The reason is very likely because, of course, there were 12 tribes of Israel. So just as in the Old Testament dispensation, where there had been 12 tribes of Israel, so in the New Testament here, there are 12 apostles of what will be, in a sense, the new Israel. The New Testament itself doesn't tell us an awful lot about these men, other than some of them their occupation, but that is probably because the New Testament is more concerned with about telling us about their master, Jesus, and his work, rather than the workers being glorified. These men, ordinary people with no special background, people from many different spheres of thinking and background, are going to be the very foundation stones on which the church is built. Then, as today, it is on the labours of ordinary men and women that the Church of Christ is built upon. And we see that happening first here in these Gospel accounts and later in the Book of Acts and, of course, down throughout the history of the Church. When we put together the three accounts of the calling of the Twelve from across the three Gospel accounts, certain illuminating facts really do emerge about them and their role. Firstly, we need to recognise that he chose them. Jesus called his disciples. He chose them probably from out of a larger crowd of followers. If you read Luke's account of these events, it's very clear that that's what happens. It seems that Jesus looked upon the crowds who were starting to follow him and he chose from within them a smaller brand and some have suggested that he perhaps chose those who had stayed with him and around him when the greater crowds had departed. Now there are many tasks for people who are called to follow Christ to do in the kingdom of God. There are tasks for those who are young and fit and can go out into the world and there are tasks for those who may be at the point in life where they need to stay at home. There are tasks for those who can use their hands practically and there are tasks for those who are primarily called to use their intellect and their mind. There are even tasks to be done that no one will ever know about or even acknowledge. But the important point is to recognise is that Jesus chose us and therefore he chose us to use whatever abilities, limited abilities even, that we have. But as well as choosing us, he calls us, just like he called them. Jesus does not force anyone to do his will or his work. He doesn't manipulate, he invites Jesus does not call an army of conscripts. He is seeking volunteers. You know, every single human being on this planet, even today, is free, completely free, free will to be faithful or to be faithless. But to every individual, there comes the call to follow, which everyone can accept or refuse. So as well as choosing them and calling them, it tells us he appoints them. Now, the King James Version uses the word that he ordained them. Mark's account 3.14 in most translations uses that word. The word translated ordain is a very simple, straightforward Greek word poien, which means to appoint or to make. But it was often technically used for appointing a person to some high office. So Jesus, in a sense, is seen to be like a king appointing his followers to be his ministers, Or, as some might say, he's like a general, allocating tasks, those he has command over. It was never the case that people are called just to drift into the service of Jesus Christ. It was then and today a case of definitely being called and being appointed, in a sense, to a role. Now, people in the world are often 
pride when they're appointed to some earthly position, but how much more can we be satisfied when we know that we are called and appointed by the King of Kings, the Lord of the Universe? But we are also chosen for a reason, and one of the reasons is to be with him. If we are to do God's work in the world, then we must live in his presence. And he invites us to accept his presence living within us before we head out into the world. So before we do that, there must be the presence of God within us that we can take out and show and give and allow people to experience that presence. No work of Christ, no work truly of the kingdom of God, this teaches, can ever be done except by someone who brings with them the presence of Christ. Now sometimes in the complexity of our modern lives and the activities of the modern church, we are so busy with committees and administrations just trying to make the wheels continue to turn that we're often in danger of forgetting that the only thing we really need is the presence of God. Now it tells us that we are called to be apostles and that word is used specifically on a few occasions in this text and in the other gospel accounts. Now the word apostle literally means one who is sent out. It is the word for an envoy or an ambassador which tells me that the Christian is Jesus Christ's ambassador to other people. He or she goes out with the presence of Christ bearing with them the word and the very presence of the master himself. And it also tells us that we are called to be heralds of Christ. Now in Matthew 10, they are told to go out and preach. And that word can also be translated as herald. So the Christian is not meant to go out there and bring people to his own opinions. His point is to preach and to bring a message of divine truth from God himself. He cannot bring the message, of course, unless he first has the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, living within him and revealing that message through him so let's just consider i'm going to read to you from verses 5 through to the first part of verse 8 and let's just look at this commissioning of his disciples so it tells us these 12 jesus sent out and commanded them saying do not go up into the way of the gentiles do not enter city of the samaritans but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of israel and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Now it begins here by Jesus commissioning of his disciples that saying he's commanding. In other words, he's giving them orders, it actually says in some translations. Now this word used here has several special usages, and I believe they all apply. The word translated command or order is a regular word used by military commanders in that time. So what that tells me is Jesus is therefore, in a sense, like a general sending his commanders out on a campaign and briefing them before they go. But it is also a word used of calling one's friends to come and help you. So Jesus here is, I believe, revealed to be like a friend, someone who has a great vision and they summon those closest to him, their friends, to help him make that vision come true. But it was also a word used of teachers setting out rules and precepts to his students, something that would have been very familiar to followers of rabbis and Greek philosophers at that time. So Jesus here is being portrayed as one who is like a teacher who is, in a sense, qualifying his students to go out into the world, saying you're equipped and you're ready to practice. You're ready to practice what you've been taught. But it was also a word which was regularly used for the imperial command. Therefore, Jesus is also seen to be like a king dispatching his ambassadors. There's that word again, his apostles, into the world to carry out his commission and to speak for him and on his behalf. But you probably can't fail to have noticed that this passage also includes a very difficult verse that many people struggle with because it begins by him forbidding the twelve to go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. There are many people who find it difficult even to believe that Jesus ever said that because this apparent exclusiveness is so unlike him and everything he sells everywhere else and all on all the other gospel accounts. 
Now, it, it is true that this verse has been abused by people throughout history, some who wanted to keep the gospel from the Jews and some who wanted to keep the gospel exclusively to the Jews, but both extremes. But there are certain things we need to understand and remember here when approaching it. There's no question he said it, so we have to look at it and we must dig deep to find the explanation of why he said it and what it means. Most Orthodox Bible experts are certain that this phrase, though accurate, is not a permanent command. In fact, just think about it. Within the Gospel accounts itself, we see and will see Jesus again talking graciously to people who aren't of the house of Israel. The time he meets a woman of Samaria at a well and reveals himself as the Messiah to her. We see him also healing the daughter of a Syrophoenician woman later, in fact, in this Matthew account, which we'll hear about and study when we get to Matthew chapter 15. And of course, Matthew tells us in the final chapter of this book, in what is often referred to as the Great Commission, he tells his followers to go out into all the world and to bring all nations into the gospel promise. So that is very clear that this is clearly a temporary uh, command. So then what is the explanation and why did he do that even temporarily? The twelve, it seems, were forbidden to go to the Gentiles. Now what that meant is they couldn't go north into Syria and they couldn't go east into Decapolis, the ten states, which were largely, very largely, Gentile regions at that time. They already could not go south into Samaria, for that was forbidden already, both politically and religiously. So the effect of this order was in fact to limit the initial journeys of the Twelve to the Galilee and Israel regions. And there were very good reasons for that. Firstly, we know that the Jews held a very special place in the plan of God, and they were to be the first to be offered the gospel. Now it is true that in the main at that time they rejected it but the whole of history has been designed by God to give them further opportunities to accept. But secondly and very importantly these 12 men were not at that point equipped to preach to the Gentiles. They had neither the background nor the knowledge as to how they could reach into Roman and Greek cultures. Before the gospel could effectively be brought to the Gentiles and the Romans, a man who had an appropriate background needed to emerge. And such a man was Paul, whose life and expertise meant that he had a much greater opportunity for success and a responsibility to do that. Even today, if we as messengers are ill-equipped to deliver the message, or even if we've got a certain amount of wisdom and common sense, we should realise our limitations. We should clearly see that in some areas we are not equipped to do what God might in the fuller extent want to do or might need to use other people to do. But maybe the greatest reason for this command is simply that Jesus, like any wise leader, he must direct his efforts at the right place. If he had diffused this small group of 12 people too thinly, he would dissipate their strength the fact that he sent them out in pairs is important because he wanted for them to be able to encourage each other. To do it any other ways would dissipate their effectiveness, invite discouragement and failure. Jesus knew that his aim should be at first to concentrate his evangelism initially on Galilee. For Galilee, as we have seen, was the most open part of all Palestine to receiving this new gospel message. So this command given here in verse 6 that they should not go to, out to the Gentiles is in fact clearly a temporary command. He, Jesus, is the wide leader who refuses to diffuse and disencourage his followers. He skillfully concentrates his disciples' efforts based on their abilities on the one simple objective initially in order to achieve an ultimate and universal victory as the gospel is spread through people, throughout, first the region, then to Rome, and then the world. Okay, let's uh, close off today's section by considering what this commission of the disciples, including the need to obey the will of God. Of all the persons who have ever lived, Jesus was clearly the only one who ever perfectly obeyed and fulfilled God's will. But the task of the twelve was not just confined to speaking words, it would involve them doing things. They had to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, it tells us there. 
Now, all these injunctions in these verses, they can be taken in two ways. They have a double sense to them. They are to be taken physically because Jesus does indeed come to bring health and healing to the bodies of men and women, but they are also to be taken spiritually. Some might say it's more important that they are taken spiritually because they describe the change that can be brought about by Jesus in the hearts and souls of people if they're exposed to him and his power and his Holy Spirit. So firstly, the command is to heal the sick. Now the word used for sick is actually quite interesting because its primary meaning means to be weak. So what this tells us, when Jesus comes into the heart of someone, he can strengthen their weaknesses and he can protect them from future attack, physically and spiritually. Jesus can strengthen us for the fight ahead, for the life ahead, and Jesus can fill our human weakness and gift us his divine power. But secondly, they're also told to raise the dead. A person can, of course, be dead physically, and we've seen Jesus do that, but a person can be dead in sin, and their will to resist sin can be completely broken, and their vision of the difference between good and evil can be blurred to the point where the line for them doesn't exist anymore. Someone may be helplessly and hopelessly in the grip of sin and blind and deaf to the goodness of God dead to the call of God in their lives. However, when Jesus Christ comes and is introduced into their lives, he can resurrect in them his goodness through the power of his spirit. In fact, he revitalizes, brings back to life goodness within them, the goodness which the sinning has oppressed and ultimately even killed. Then thirdly, they are told in these verses to go out and cleanse the lepers. Now as we've seen people with leprosy were actually regarded as polluted at that time, spiritually polluted. So this means as well as healing the sick, his disciples are to bring cleansing to the outcasts and the disenfranchised. Someone can by their own actions completely stain their life with sin and they can pollute their heart, mind and body with the consequences of their sin. Their words and actions and their influence can become so fouled and polluted that they become an unclean influence to all, to everyone whom they come into contact with. Yet Jesus can cleanse the soul of any individual, no matter how much they have corrupted themselves with sin. And then finally, he commissions them to cast out demons. Now, a demon-possessed person is an individual that represents the high point of an individual who's in the grip of an evil power. In other words, they've got to a point where they are no longer master of their own actions. The evil power within them has control over them. Now, anyone can be mastered by evil. Anyone can be dominated by evil. And evil has a potential to take a firm hold of any of us. Yet, when Jesus comes and comes to us, he comes not only to cancel sin, but to break the power of that cancel sin and to break the power of any hold that this type of evil may have over us today and in the future. Jesus can bring to anyone, anyone even who's a slave to addiction or sin, the liberating power of God. And the disciples then, as we are called today, no, as we are commissioned today, we are to take that saving healing power out into the world and that's something that this passage tells us we are not only called to do and commissioned to do but we are equipped to do by his holy spirit okay let's begin today's time together by picking up the text in the second half of verse 8 of chapter 10 and see what it can teach us and remember this is jesus speaking to his disciples, commissioning them and sending them out. And it says, Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now, this is a passage in which Almost every sentence, every phrase would have rung a bell in the mind of the first century Jews who heard it said. In it, Jesus is giving his instruction to his disciples, which all the rabbis, or at least the very best of the rabbis of that time, 
would have tried to give similar to their students and disciples. And the first being, he says, freely you have received, so freely give. Now you see, Jesus, as all Jewish rabbis at that time, were bound by the Mosaic law. And they were bound to give their teaching freely for nothing, to ask no charge for it. The rabbi was absolutely forbidden to take money for teaching the law that Moses had received freely from God. In only one case could a rabbi accept payment. He might accept payment for the teaching of a child. For to teach a child was a parent's task, the Mosaic Law said. No one else should be required to spend that time and labour doing what was considered a parent's own duty. However, sometimes parents would pass that responsibility on to a rabbi and it was appropriate to pay them for that privilege. But generally, religious teaching had to be given without charge, without a request for money and without any set price. This principle applied at other times too. In the Mishnah, the law laid it down that if a man took payments, for example, for acting as a judge, his judgments were then invalid. And it also said that if someone took payment for giving evidence as a witness in the court, then that witness's testimony was also void. And it's interesting that these are legal principles that were set in place at least 4,000 years ago, but they still apply to this day. A famous teacher from around the time of Christ called Rabbi Zadok said, Make not the law a crown wherewith to aggrandize thyself, nor a spade with which to dig thyself a grave. Another contemporary teacher of the time of Jesus called Hillel said, He who makes a worldly use of the crown of the law shall waste away. Hence thou mayst infer that whoever desireth a prophet for himself from the words of God is helping on his own destruction. Strong words indeed. So it was laid down that just as God had taught Moses freely, without charge, without request, so should rabbis do also. By the way, there was another story of a teacher who at the time a very famous teacher from the time of Jesus called Rabbi Tarfon and he told of a story as how as a young rabbi he was once walking through a fig grove just after the fig harvest had taken place and as he passed through he ate some of the figs that had been missed and been left behind. The watchman of the fields came upon him and he started to beat him and there were several of them but he told them to stop and he told them who he was and and because he was a famous rabbi well known in the region they stopped and they let him go but all his life he said that he regretted that he'd used his status as a rabbi to save himself in writing about this he wrote all my days did i grieve for woe was me for i have used the crown of the law for my own profit so there was obviously, people had very strong opinions and strict views on this at that time. So when Jesus tells his disciple that they have freely received and they must freely give, he's telling them what the teachers of his own people and the rabbis of his time had been telling students for years. You see, the principle is, if we possess a precious secret, a precious insight from God, it is our duty not to hold on to it just for ourselves, but we should willingly, in fact, as best we can, try and pass it on to others. It should, in a sense, be a privilege always to share with others the riches of God, any riches that God has given us, both practically and spiritually, in the sense of insights into his word and his law. But Jesus also tells his, his disciples they're not to set out to acquire wealth gold, silver or bronze for their purses. Now the Greek word used here for purse literally meant a girdle and this was a girdle which they wore around their waist. It was sort of a rather broad double belt and at each end for part of its length it had a double sided piece of material creating a gap with which one could keep valuables and money relatively safely. Money was often carried in that double part of the girdle. So the girdle acted as a sort of a purse for a Jewish traveller. But he also, Jesus tells them, not to take a bag for the journey. Now the bag he is talking about could be one of two things. It could be like a bag, a modern day haversack, in which provisions would ordinarily have been carried. 
But there's also another possibility. The word could have meant what was called a collecting bag. Sometimes the wandering rabbi and philosopher, they would take up a collection by placing a special bag on the ground while addressing the crowd. So in all these instructions, don't think that Jesus is just laying upon his disciples a deliberate and calculated discomfort that they should suffer. It's more the principles that lie behind their motivation for going out teaching the word of God. And once again, by speaking these words in this way, these are words that would have been very familiar to all the Jews of that era who heard it. Furthermore, the Talmud actually does say that no one was to go to the Temple Mount with staff, shoes, girdle of money, same thing as mentioned here, or dusty feet. The idea, when someone enters the temple, that they should make it quite clear that they've left all the worldly stuff behind. Everything to do with their trade, their business, their financial, their worldly affairs. All those should be left outside the temple. And what I believe Jesus is saying to his disciples, and there by nature to us today, by applying this principles, that when we head out in mission, we must treat the whole world in a sense like the temple of God. If you're a child of God, you must never give the impression that your faith is in any way a business or profession through which you wish to store up wealth. Now, that immediately rings up an alarm bell in my mind because it seems to me that teaching stands in contrast to so many modern day preachers who often to me seem to focus on financing their own ministries or lifestyles. Jesus' instruction means that the man of God must show interest by his attitude to material things in that it should always be secondary to their first interest, which is to spread the message of God. But then finally, Jesus says something about this this famous phrase, that the workman deserves his wage, sometimes translated as sustenance, sometimes as food. Once again, the Jews would have recognized this phrase totally. Now, although it was true that a rabbi should not accept payment for the preaching of the word, but it was also true that it was considered at the same time to be a privilege and an obligation to support someone who was teaching you from the scriptures. It was the ordinary person's responsibility to financially support a Bible teacher. If he was truly a man of God and you are learning spiritual truths and benefiting from his ministry, then the ordinance here is that you should financially support that work. Another famous first century rabbi called Rabbi Jokohan laid it down that it was the duty of every Jewish community to support a rabbi. And all the more so because the rabbi will be naturally neglecting his own affairs to concentrate on other people and the application of the things of God into the lives of those people. Rabbi Eliezer ben Jacob, another contemporary of Jesus, wrote, He who receives a rabbi in his house or as his guest and lets him have enjoyment of his possessions, the scripture ascribes it to him as if he has offered a continual blessing. So here then is the double truth contained within this teaching. Firstly, that any man or woman must not be over concerned with material things if they are a preacher and a teacher of the word of God. But secondly, equally important is the people of God must never feel in their duty, their responsibility to see that Bible teachers receive reasonable support. This passage lays down an obligation to both the teacher and on the people benefiting from his teaching alike. So having looked at the equipping of God's messengers, let's take a moment now to consider what Jesus teaches them about their conduct, the conduct of God's messengers as they're out and about in the world. So we're picking up the text at verse 11, where Jesus tells them, When you enter into any city or village, make inquiries as to who in it is worthy, and stay there until you go out of it. When you come into a household, give greetings to it, If the house is worthy, then let your peace rest upon it. If it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not receive you and will not listen to your words, when you leave that house or that city, shake off the dust of it from your feet. This is the truth, I tell you. It will be easier for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment 
than it is for that city. So here is a passage full of the most practical type of advice for anyone who wishes to be the Lord's messenger. When they entered a city or village, they were to seek out a house that was known uh, as well in a way that is described as worthy. The point is, they are to look out for those who offer support or accommodation. And if it's in a house that has a bad reputation, either for morals or conduct, or even just poor fellowship, well, they shouldn't stay there. It could seriously harm their reputation and thereby in the longer term hinder their ability in spreading the gospel message. You see, they were not to identify themselves with anyone who might prove to be a moral handicap in the future or any situation for that matter. Now, this does not for one minute mean to say that they were not to seek out to win people for Christ, but it is to say that the messenger of Jesus must take great care with whom they make close friendships with and with whom they receive financial support from. When they entered a house, they were to stay in it until they moved on to the next place. Now, this was very much a matter of courtesy within the culture of that day. Because, of course, they might be tempted after getting to know an area for a while, having won over certain supporters and converts over in a particular place, they might be tempted to move to another house again, maybe a house which could provide more luxury, more comfort. The message of Jesus must never be seen to give the impression that anyone is courting people for the sake of material things or for the fact that they have financial resources. Or that our movements are dictated by the demands of our own comfort rather than where we're really called to go where the greatest need is. Now the passage also talks about the giving of the greeting of peace but it also says this thing about taking it back again. Now this may sound strange to us but this was a typically Middle Eastern thing to do in those days particularly and to an extent it still goes on today. In the Middle East, then as today, a spoken word is thought to have a kind of active, independent existence. It goes out of the mouth as independently as an arrow from the bow, and it finds its place. Now, this idea emerged regularly in the Old Testament, especially in connection with words spoken by God. For example, as I hear God say in chapter 45, 23, by myself I have sworn from my mouth, and it has gone forth in righteousness a word that shall not return void. And in chapter 55, 11 of Isaiah, he says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which it is sent. And Zechariah, he sees a flying scroll and he hears a voice speaking the word that says, this is the curse that goes over the face of the whole land. So out it goes into the world. And to this day in the Middle East, if someone speaks their religious blessing to a passerby and wishes a peace upon them, and then they discover that the passerby is in fact of another faith, they will sometimes even come and take their blessing back again. So the idea here is that the messenger of God can offer their blessing and their rest upon a house or a village or a city or a town. But if it turns out that that house is unworthy or it rejects that message of blessing, then he can, as it were, recall it. This situation then meant for them, who were really, in a sense, acting as travelling evangelists, if they found any town or village or city where the message was refused, then the messenger of God, them on this occasion, were free to shake the dust off that place, off their feet, and to move on. And that principle applies to us today, I believe, to a degree. We don't need to keep going back to the same places again and again and try and persuade people or heaven help us dispute or argue people into the kingdom. We reach a point where we move on and we focus our resources where they're more willingly received. You see, the picture painted here comes from the idea that to the Jews of Jesus' day, the dust of a Gentile place or road was in fact defiling. Therefore, when, for example, a Jew crossed the border of Palestine and then they entered back into their own country after a journey outside in Gentile lands, they would stand at the border and shake the dust 
of the Gentile roads off their feet. So that, the, in a sense, spiritually, that last part uh, particles of pollution might, in a sense, be cleansed away. So Jesus is saying here, if a city or a village, they don't receive you, you may treat it thereafter as a Gentile place. Now, again, we must be clear that what is Jesus is saying here in this passage has both a temporary and an eternal truth. The temporary part of this truth is this. Jesus is not saying that certain people should be abandoned or that they are in any way outside the message of the gospel or beyond the reach of the grace of God. This was an instruction like that opening instruction we talked about last time about going not initially to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. It came from the situation in which it is given and it was probably simply due to the time factor and the mission involved that was placed upon these disciples. You see, time was short and as many people as possible should hear the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And there was no time to argue with people who were just seeking to, to be stubborn. There perhaps would be time to come back later. But at this moment, these 12 guys, this small initial start of the spread of the gospel, the disciples had been given mission to tour the whole country as quickly as possible. And therefore, they had to keep moving on. And that if they were not immediately made welcome or their message was refused, then they were free to move on from that. But the permanent truth of this teaching is that one of the basic facts of life is that time and time again an opportunity may be offered to someone or may come to someone and present itself and if it's not taken up at that moment then it can pass them by and it may never come back again. To these people in Palestine there was an opportunity to receive the gospel but if they did not take the opportunity it might very well be missed and never return. As the Proverbs themselves said, three things do not come back. The spoken word, the spent arrow, and the lost opportunity. This happens, we know, in every sphere of life. The tragedy of life is often the tragedy of lost opportunities. And then finally, Jesus says, this last verse, he says, that it will be easier for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for the town or the city which has refused this message of Christ and the kingdom. So what does that mean? Because we know Sodom and Gomorrah are repeatedly quoted in the New Testament as representing, well, they're sort of the proverbial representations of wickedness. They're quoted in Matthew 11, Luke 10, Luke 17, in Romans, Peter in the second letter talks about it, and in Jude. Now, it's interesting to note, and it's helpful to understand what Jesus means by this, that these cities of Sodom and Gomorrah had been guilty of an appalling breach of the law of hospitality just prior to their destruction. You see, they too had rejected the messengers of God who had come about them. More than rejected, they wanted to abuse these messengers in the most appalling way. But what Jesus is pointing out is even at their worst, Sodom and Gomorrah were not given the opportunity to reject this message of the kingdom of God and of the Messiah's arrival in Christ. So that was why that in a spiritual sense it is, it will be easier for them in the last judgment than it will be for these towns and villages of Galilee who have the Messiah before them and the disciples of the Messiah, but they're rejecting it. You see, it's always true that the greater the privilege, the greater the opportunity, then the greater the responsibility is for all of us to respond to it. Okay, friends, well, here we are again, and we're picking up the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 10. And we're going to be considering together the various challenges that we face as being a disciple of God. As first of all, relayed to us through the teaching of Jesus and his disciples and what that might mean to us today. And the first thing we're going to consider is one of the main challenges of being a disciple is dealing with opposition. But before we deal with the passage in detail, I'd like us just to take note of a couple of things. When we were studying the Sermon of the Mount a few weeks back, we noticed that one of Matthew's great characteristics was his way of laying things out in a very systematic and relevant order. Matthew's custom was to collect in one place 
all the material that Jesus said about or were relevant to a specific subject. Even if it was sometimes, we can identify by comparing it to the other synoptic gospels, that it was gathered together, words spoken by Jesus, but on several different occasions. And this passage, many believe, is one of those instances where Matthew has collected his material from different times and places. He has collected the things which Jesus says about this subject we're going to look at on various occasions from when he's heard him speak. And here he pulls together some references Jesus has made to persecution. And he puts together both what Jesus said when he sent his men out on their first expedition and also some stuff that he taught them about what would happen after his resurrection and return to the Father and then also his return in the second coming. So he's talking to them primarily at a point of time when they're going out into the world. So as we're going through this Gospel of Matthew, we've seen that there's a difference, a distinction between being a child of God and being a disciple. Matthew's very clear about that. I've called it the difference between being a child and being a disciple because in order for it to be a child of God, all we have to do is trust in Jesus Christ. That's Matthew's perspective and the other gospel accounts and the teachings that follow in the letters after that. The Bible very clearly teaches that God simply wants to give us heaven as a gift. It was said of that in Romans 6.23 when Paul wrote, The gift of God is eternal life and that that simply comes about by trusting in Jesus Christ who died in our place to pay for our sins. Following Christ, though, is something else again. If you become a follower of Christ, then you've decided not only to trust in him in order to gain access to heaven, but in reality, it's a decision that you want to live your life and learn to be like him. The word disciple itself just means student or learner. So in a sense, you've made a decision to learn how to live your life from that point forward. In other words, you've gone beyond the clear step of just trusting in him for your salvation, but you're actually making a decision to obey him, whatever words he says and whatever words he teaches. And if you start to do that, then I believe, and Matthew points it out here, that this whole other world may open up to you, so to speak. In Matthew chapter 4, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So if you become a follower of Christ and you do that, what he's saying is you start at some level to begin to introduce or to talk about Jesus Christ to other people. But there is something that you need to know and Matthew wants to warn us about here. And Jesus himself, of course, by relaying it, Jesus is warning his disciples about this, which is why Matthew wants to include us to let us know, who will read his gospel later, that these same principles apply to us. He wants us to know that if we go swimming in those waters, then we're going to discover their shark-infested waters, so to speak. In other words, for those who have made the decision to obey, to follow Christ, to be disciples, they will very soon, likely, discover they meet opposition. In fact, for some, it can be a whole lot more than opposition. In some parts of the world, even today, Christians face outright persecution for choosing to follow the Lord. So what should we do if that happens? How should we handle it if we meet really strong, direct opposition to our Christian faith? What happens when it becomes more than just resistance or verbal abuse? What would we do if we became the victims of outright persecution, as would happen to many of these disciples? Well, Jesus here is preparing them for that, and we can learn something from that. When he sent them out, he told them what was likely, what was coming, but he also helpfully told them what to do when it happens. So what I'd like to do today is take some time to look at what he told them. There are some timeless truths here because they apply not only to what he was telling the disciples then, but to all Christian disciples in all ages. And that's what I want us to take a look at today. So if you'd like to know how to handle opposition when you express your Christian faith, because if you're a disciple of Christ, you're going to meet that type of resistance. And I invite your attention to Matthew chapter 10. And let me begin by just reading these three verses from 16 to 18 for you. Where Jesus said, remember he's talking to his disciples as he sent them out. And he said, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. 
But be aware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will also be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them, to the Gentiles. So what we see here are two potential types of persecutions that face Christians. Now the immediate context of this passage is of course Matthew sending out these 12 guys, these 12 apostles. And he says in the early part of this chapter that he sent them out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. He's giving his disciples here, and perhaps for all of us in all ages, timeless instructions concerning the opposition that we might face. And in this portion of his commission, so to speak, he focuses on the opposition that they're going to get initially from unbelievers. As I see and read these verses, I see within them four pieces of advice given, four pieces of advice for us to follow. The first thing he clearly says is that we should be wise. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, if you're going to live a life in obedience to his commands, and thereby accepting this commission to go and tell others about him, one of the first things you simply know is you need to approach this task with wisdom. Look at verse 16. He says, I'm sending you out as sheep into the midst of worlds. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. This verse indicates that they and we are to be wise, and we are to be wise because we're like a sheep in a pack of the middle of wolves. And of course, a lamb in the midst of a pack of wolves would be considered vulnerable, defenseless. He has to depend on the shepherd for his protection. So Jesus says, you are like a helpless lamb, and I'm sending you out there among the wolves, so you're going to have to depend on me to protect you. But what I want you to know is, although you need to be wise as a serpent, you should be harmless as a dove. Now, it helps to understand this tricky scripture, which represent two very different perspectives on how we should be, one and both at the same time. If we understand that the Greek word translated here, wise, means to be practically wise. It means to be sensible and prudent. It's not some sort of abstract wisdom of the likes of a philosopher. It's a sort of street wisdom kind of thing. Street smart. That's the idea he means here. But he quickly couples it with the fact that we also need to be harmless as a dove. Now the idea behind harmless also contains within it means we are to be pure, to be simple, to be unmixed in our motives. I remember wrestling with this verse a number of years ago when I was going through the book of James and at the end of chapter 3 it comes up against a similar idea and James talks about how our motives need to be pure and I remember then I connected that passage with this passage here because it's talking about having pure motives. In other words, we go out into these situations and although they're dangerous, we go out with very pure motives. We're not out there to try and manipulate anybody. We're not out there to try and fleece anybody in any way. Our motives have to be untameless. So in that way, we are to be harmless as a dove. We must have no plans to deceive or manipulate anybody in any way. We all recognize doves as a very nervous, flighty animal, one that will fly away at the slightest provocation. So what Jesus is teaching us is that we must be mild, we must be wise, and we must be harmless. We're not to go out in any way that would hurt anybody by the message we have to deliver. We're not meant to cause upset or disturb them for upset's sake. What Jesus is teaching here is that his disciples are to be tough, single-minded but also tender-hearted at the same time they must be shrewd wise but not allow that to slip over into being cunning or deceptive and they must be innocent but at the same time not let that innocence step over into being naive and then of course we must be pure in motive and thereby have no motivation to do anybody any harm so that's the first thing he says there's a lot in there isn't there but there's more because he goes on to say other things we need to be aware of and when we look at verse 17 because he says beware they will deliver you up to councils and maybe scourge you whip you in their synagogues and you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them to the gentiles now this council he talks about is being handed over to it was the leadership of the local church 
verse 17 is talking about the fact that these guys here, these disciples are being sent out and it's very likely because of the nature of the way the local Jewish synagogue system worked that they would be brought before the local Jewish religious leaders wherever they travelled through and if they fall foul of those councils they very well may be whipped. Now sure enough, those days, the religious leaders in Palestine did have authority to punish people for all kinds of things. And one of those punishments they were allowed to do was to scourge them. Now under Roman law, they weren't allowed to kill them. They could scourge them up to a limited number of strokes that could cause suffering but would not cause death. Which is why, by the way, they had to go to the Romans and hand them over to have Jesus crucified because they could not inflict that sort of punishment. But Jesus says here that his followers who go out into those situations may indeed face three kinds of trials. First of all, we notice that it says the state might persecute them. They might be brought before councils and governors. When Christ's followers are brought to court to judgment, he says they're not to worry about what to say. He actually says, for God will give them the words, I will be your mouth and teach you what to speak. But also the church would persecute them. The church, i.e. the synagogues of those days, did not like their places to be upset. And they had ways of dealing with people who were classed as disturbers of the peace by coming in and giving strange or different teachings. And these Christians, of course, these early disciples, and throughout the early church history, they would go into these towns and cities and they would turn the world upside down around these local Jewish communities. And then finally, their families might even persecute them. Their nearest and dearest, they might think they've gone mad, but they might, at the very least, will shut the door against them. Sometimes Christians, particularly new believers, are confronted with some really hard times. And one of the hardest things they will face, the hardest choice of all they might have to be forced to make, is the choice between obedience to what Jesus Christ says and obedience to their friends and family. And Jesus also warned that in the days to come, believers, disciples, might well find that state and church and family all join against them. Now, no one can read this passage without being deeply impressed with the absolute honesty of Jesus. He never hesitated to tell people just what they might expect if they followed them. And he didn't sugar the medicine, if you like. Now, this stands in stark contrast, seems to me, to the way the world and the modern church thinks it needs to win followers. The world will offer a person wine and roses all the way. They'll promise comfort, ease, advancement for the fulfilment of worldly ambitions. But Jesus here, in the launching and the beginning of the early church and his first disciples, he offers his followers hardship and death. It's interesting to me that Churchill, when calling people to resist the Nazi rise in Europe, what he offered the British people in their call to war was nothing else, he said, than blood, toil, sweat and tears. A famous explorer that I'm very interested in, a guy called Ernest Shackleton, when he proposed his march to the South Pole, he asked for volunteers that would be willing to trek amid the blizzards and across the polar ice. He was very clear he expected it to be extremely difficult, yet he was still inundated with letters from young and old, rich and poor, from the highest people in society to the lowest, all desiring to share in that great adventure. And he had to show incredible wisdom to work out and sort out the romantics, as he described it, from the practically gifted and uh, motivated people. I feel for me that it's interesting that I believe in some sense that modern church needs to learn that we can't really attract people if we're just saying it's going to be an easy way of life. Not only may they become discouraged when they find out at times how difficult the Christian life can be and the opposition that they face, it seems much more pertinent to me to call people and recognise that that call is to a heroic struggle. And I also believe, ironically, that that is what ultimately speaks to men and women's hearts. Now, we've been studying through this chapter for a few days now. But if you go think about it and read chapter 10 from the beginning in its entirety, and not just these few verses that we've arrived at and have pulled out in isolation today. But if you read the whole chapter and then you came to this verse, it would jump off the page at you. 
If we go back and look at the beginning of the chapter, he said in verse 5, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then it continues and it leads into this. So what is going on here? He sent them to Israel now, and now he tells them they're going to be persecuted by the Gentiles. It's that observation, as well as a few others, that has driven most Bible teachers to the conclusion that what he's doing theologically here, he's not only addressing them for today and for their future mission, but he's at some sense jumping forward to a time in the future called the Tribulation. And this will certainly seem to be confirmed when we later get to verse 33, when in this chapter he talks about the coming of the Son of Man. And that is very clearly a reference to the second coming. So apparently he's giving these instructions to the disciples. And for that he has a near view in that they're going to experience opposition now. But he also wants to lay down the principle that this is going to apply to everyone right up to and prior to his second coming. It's fulfilled there now for them today. But there's more to come and it will come again throughout church history who knew how long it would be at that time and it will be ultimately be fulfilled when he comes again this is not an uncommon thing the bible frequently talks about prophecy and jesus himself does it and when he does it he often has this multi time factored approach he's speaking for the immediate future and he's also skipping to the longer term future and how it will be fully fulfilled ultimately there And apparently Bible experts say that's actually exactly what's going on here. But be that as it may, and that will be critical for something that we're going to look at tomorrow. But for today, I want to point out to you that what we need to understand and take out of this as disciples, as people who have chosen to obey and follow Jesus, is that we're going to face opposition day to day as we go out and do that. Maybe even for some facing physical danger and harm. That is the sort of thing that absolutely Christ says is very likely to those that are a witness to him and those who want to testify to others of the love of God in Christ. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to prepare you ahead of time because there are wolves out there. There are sharks swimming in these waters. So be prepared. There's going to be opposition to us and what we do. Jesus then goes on not only to tell us the facts of that we're going to be persecuted, but he also gives us a little theological insight, if you like, some of the reasons that the Christian and the Christian church is persecuted. And firstly, and some would say probably the main thing, is that Christians and the Christian church are persecuted because it threatens the established order. Looking at things from our point of view, we may find it hard to understand and think, why would a government wished to persecute the Christians within their land, where their only aim is to live in honesty, in purity, to support others, to support charity, to express love to others, and to live a quiet, respectful life. But in the latter days, and today, and in those days of the Roman government, they all will consider themselves to having good reasons for persecuting Christians. Here's one that I'll just describe to you. One reason where Christian culture conflicts with the current thinking of the time in terms of the Romans at the time of Jesus. I don't think I can pass by, particularly in these days, with very heightened views on justice and equality, of drawing our attention to the issue of slavery and what that meant in the Roman church as the Christian church began to grow. A very real difficulty for the Roman authorities was the position of slaves within the Christian church. Across the entire Roman Empire, there were estimated to be 60 million slaves. And it was always one of the main fears of the empire, particularly in the first centuries, that these slaves might rise in revolt. If the structure of this empire of Rome was to remain intact, they had to be kept in place and nothing could be done or should be done by anyone to encourage them to rebel in any way, because the consequences might be terrible beyond imagining for the Roman state. Now, although the Christian church made no attempt to free the slaves, it did within the church at least treat slaves as equal. 
Clement of Alexander is on record as pleading that slaves are like ourselves, as he said. And the words of Christ and his salvation applied equally to every one of them, as it did even the person of the most high-born in society. Lactanius, a Roman writer who was a Christian, wrote that their slaves are not slaves to us. We deem them as brothers after the Spirit of God, in work and in religion as fellow servants. Worse than that for the Romans was the fact that it was perfectly possible for a slave to hold high office in the Christian church. As early as the second century, there were two bishops of Rome, guys called Callistus and Pius, who had been slaves, and it was not uncommon at all for elders and deacons to be slaves in the church. In the list of names that closes off the book of Romans, Greek experts have identified that within that list there is a leader of a household, someone who has a rich household, who has a lowly position in the church, and that the pastor, or, or at least the deacon in that church, is actually a slave of that person. So in terms of their treatment of slaves, the Christian church seemed to be a potential, as far as the Roman authorities were concerned, as a force for disrupting the very basis of the civilization and the empire they were trying to build. They threatened the very existence of the Roman Empire by giving slaves positions that they should never or could never have had as Roman law sought. There is no doubt that Christianity seriously affected certain vested interests connected with both the Roman religion and the Roman state. When Christianity came to Ephesus, for example, the trade of the local silversmiths was dealt an almost mortal blow as far fewer people started to desire to buy the images that they were created. Christianity preaches a view that no totalitarian state can accept or can live with. Christianity deliberately aims to obliterate certain trades and professions. And it will do that to this day. It will make the making of money, passively or specifically, out of certain areas almost impossible within a Christian society by nature of the people turning away from those things. Things like prostitution or slavery, as I mentioned earlier. And it still does that today. Therefore, for that thing, if nothing else, Christians still today are liable to persecutions for the faith. If you're going to be committed to following Jesus Christ, then you're going to meet some opposition. That's what he's teaching here. So we need to be prepared. It's coming. But you know what? It's not all bad news. Knowing that will keep you on your toes. As J. Keek Chesterton, the famous English writer, once says, I like being in hot water spiritually because it keeps me clean. Think about that. Jesus now will give a third suggestion, and he'll do that where we pick it up in verse 19. Okay, here we are, folks, picking up at Matthew chapter 10, verse 19 to 23 we're going to be covering today. And we're thinking about the reasons that we as individuals, or even perhaps the Christian church, is persecuted. This is the second in two parts looking at this issue. And we saw last time that in its treatment of slaves, the Christian church seemed to the Roman authorities a force which was in a sense disrupting their civilization and threatening potentially the very existence of the Roman Empire. You see, by giving slaves a position what they should never have had according to Roman law, they were beginning to see Christianity as something that would, could seriously affect certain vested interests they had, connected not only with the Roman religion but with the administration of the state. You see, Christianity in a sense, even today, preaches a view of humanity in which no totalitarian state can survive long term. Either Christianity will spread and the power of the oppressor will recede, or the state will attempt to crush it by persecution. Christianity deliberately eliminates by its very existence certain worldviews and even some trades and occupations as ways of making money. Obvious things like prostitution and slavery come into mind, but also by changing the demand in the marketplace, it can really prejudicially affect vested interests, even today. It still does that to this day, which also, of course, the other side of that coin is that every Christian believer, even today, is still predisposed to persecution for their faith. 
If we're going to be committed to following Jesus Christ, then we're going to meet opposition out there. So this passage is telling us to be prepared for that. Not only the church, but the individuals within the church may be persecuted because they're challenging the established order of things. Now this passage now suggests another way in which the Christian believer might face opposition and it starts to be unpacked for us beginning in verse 19. So Matthew 10, 19 says, But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should say. So he's talking in verse 19 about being delivered up, handed over if you like, but at the same time trying to encourage us and say, don't worry when that happens. This handing over may be to civil or a religious authorities or even both. Now that sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? And even today in some countries, people are still arrested and thrown in prison for just making the decision to follow Jesus. It even mentions martyrdom here, which sadly, even today, is definitely a possible repercussion of becoming a Christian in some countries today. This is indeed heavy duty stuff that he's preparing us for. But right in the middle of it, he says, oh, by the way, that might happen, but don't worry. Don't worry about it. Now, you may have noticed that this phrase, don't worry, is a bit of a repeating refrain in this chapter. Back in chapter 9, he said, do not worry about how you speak and what you say. So he said, don't worry about the content of what you're going to say and don't worry about the form in which you're going to say it. Now, let me be clear, this attitude of not worrying about what we say when it comes to speaking about God is not meant to apply to us today on Sunday mornings or in any way about the preparation of sermon or teaching or anything like this. This is not intended to be the normal approach to preaching or teaching or even in terms of evangelism. It's trying to tell us how we should respond to persecution when we face it. This is not intended to undermine the need for the preparation when teaching from the scriptures. This is talking about something that is applied to emergency situations like when you're standing before a person of authority facing persecution. Those moments he's telling us to be calm and relax and allow God to speak to us and through us. So this applies to those people then and still people today who are facing direct persecution for their Christian faith. And it says we need in those moments to take time to pray and prepare our thoughts and our defence. And Jesus says that if we're caught in that sort of situation, that's what we should do. So try not to worry about it. There's a verse in the Bible that teaches us that the Holy Spirit can teach you all things and it can bring to mind all things when you need them. But that for most of us will take place over a period of time and in most of our lives it will be a situation of a journey, a journey of Bible study and commitment to seeking answers. But the promise here is that in these extreme situations the Lord says don't worry about that. And he explains why in verse 20, because he says, For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father who will speak in and through you. That's Matthew 10, 20. And that's why we don't need to worry. Now I'd like to turn here just for a moment and take a pause and look at Exodus chapter 4 and show you a situation where this happened in the Old Testament to a man called Moses. You see, God told Moses to go before Pharaoh, the king of the land, and tell him to let my people go. The children of Israel were facing extreme persecution and were, in fact, in slavery. And Moses had been told by God that he was the man that he was to go before this authoritarian king and say, let my people go. So look quickly at the conversation between Moses and God. Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither before nor since. You have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, therefore, and he's talking to Moses here, Go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what you shall say. 
So we're talking about a very scary situation for Moses here. We're talking about a situation where he could potentially lose his head. And Moses is saying, yeah, Lord, you've spoken to me and that's a privilege and it's amazing, but I'm not eloquent. I'm not the one to speak on your behalf. And God says, Moses, just go. I will be your mouth and teach you what to say. That then and this aspect today enables us to face our fears feeling accompanied and equipped by God himself. Okay back to the Matthew text and at this point it tells us something else picking up in verse 21. It says now brother will deliver up brother to death and father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Let me make a couple of points about what this passage means and what it doesn't mean. Because he's clearly saying here, don't worry. But however, you need to notice that earlier on it said about being set before, taken up before religious leaders, and then being delivered to civil leaders. In other words, facing opposition and maybe being pulled before courts, both religious and civil. But now he adds that we may even get opposition from our very own families. Now I've seen all these three types of persecution played out in my life. Fortunately the family one didn't apply to me personally, but I have seen it happen to others many times. I've also had the privilege just this year of speaking and doing some videos for pastors and evangelists in Pakistan. And the government in that country and in countries like that can come down on pastors and their congregations pretty hard sometimes. I've also seen people get saved and because their families belong to another faith group or they've come from another religious background, they get all kinds of opposition from people who follow that particular religious persuasion. I have seen myself and heard endless stories of people having fierce opposition from their own families when they come to Christ. And if they dare start to witness for him, then things can get really bad for them. But that's what Jesus is talking about here. And he says that right in the middle of all this going on, he tells his followers, and that's us friends as well, if you're a disciple of his, he says, do not worry. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Now I need to point out what he's not saying here. That he's not talking about us being saved from spiritually that has already happened and persecution cannot rob you of your salvation you don't have to endure to the end to make it to heaven the verse is not talking about salvation what Matthew is talking about here is the subject of persecution the word saved here or safe here means to be delivered from the physical situation you're facing that's why I've chosen the translation that says safe because I know there are some out there that say saved Matthew's subject at this point in this verse is not about salvation from sin. That has already happened for the Christian believer. His subject that he's writing about in this chapter of Matthew chapter 10 is talking about persevering in the face of persecution. So he's clearly not talking about salvation of your spiritual life. He's talking about being safe from the situation of the opposition that you might face for being a Christian. So if anybody you know is using this verse to teach that you've got to endure to the end or you won't get to heaven, then they're taking this verse out of context. They're ripping it from its moorings and, uh, and letting it float over to another area that it doesn't belong. Because that is not what this verse is about, friends. The point of this passage is that we should endure persecution if it comes and also reminding us that it's very likely that opposition and persecution will in fact come our way. The whole point of this little subsection in these verses is about telling us not to be afraid, not to worry. And Jesus has done this repeatedly through, in fact he did it a lot, through the Sermon on the Mount, which we covered some time back, and it took us several months to get through that. But repeatedly he said it then, and here in chapter 10 he's saying it again. I want you to be aware there's trouble out there, he said. There's wolves in the wood, there's sharks in the water, and there's vultures flying overhead. But don't worry, in all that you can still trust me, like a lamb trusts a shepherd. 
Jesus says one more thing in this section, and that's in verse 23, where he says, When they persecute you in the city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will have not gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Okay, this is a bit of a tricky verse, isn't it? He says to these disciples that you're not going to get through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now, some commentators look at that and say, wow, Jesus made a mistake here because they did make it through the cities of Israel. The only problem is they don't understand. He has projected this speech not to just his disciples of, of his day, but for all the believers down through time. This verse covers the whole epoch of time right up to the second coming. Now, I didn't go into it in detail, but yesterday's message and today's, there are references to Matthew 23 and 24 coming up, which he'll pick up again later, specifically in relation to the sec- his second coming. But this verse is meant to apply to the whole epoch of time, right through from the calling of the first disciples to every disciple thereafter and their sins up until the second coming. But also there's a very practical point being made here as well. In that, if people don't accept what you're saying, he's teaching us to move on, to keep going. Go find someone or someplace else that they will listen to you. Don't get stuck there and don't get defeated there. Just keep moving. So I think the point here is that when we face opposition and people don't accept what we say, it doesn't mean we stop testifying and witnessing or explaining. We just keep going and going. For them, it meant that if the people in a town or a village that they visited, they didn't buy in with what they were saying in one place, they were just to move on to the next place, to the next village, the next town, or the next city, to just keep going. So in summary, I just want to sum up this whole section that we've covered these last couple of days and make, I think, a couple of pertinent observations. I think this passage is clearly talking about persecution. In fact, I'd say you'd be blind to miss that if you saw it as anything else. And Jesus is clearly saying that opposition is a very real possibility. If you're a believer, it will come your way and people may even intend to harm you. But even when you're facing those sorts of situations, remember, don't respond in a way that might do harm to others. Just keep moving on. Keep talking about the Lord, trusting in him, not worrying Or to say it another way, the way to handle opposition is just to keep going and to use these oppositions as opportunities to talk about the Lord. Opposition should not deter us or prevent us. It should just make us more resolved to keep going. I think there are some naive Christians out there who think, you know what, I'm going to get, once I'm saved, I'm going to follow the Lord and things are going to be just like heaven for me. Well, if that's what you think, then you're getting ahead of yourself. Not yet anyway. There's going to be great joy and heaven does await. But as long as we're here in the flesh on this earth, we're going to face trouble. Those of us who preach and teach from the word, I believe are called to speak with the same frankness and honesty that Jesus himself spoke with. Jesus here warns us, his people, throughout all time, that we will face all manner of difficulty because of our decision to become a Christian believer. But through it all, we can count on him and we can also count on his Holy Spirit to aid us in all our defences against both civic, religious authorities, as well as even opposition from our own families. He doesn't offer us a life of comfort. He instead asks us to prepare for a life of hardship, peril, and maybe even for some, even today, death itself. Now, on the surface, this is hardly the way to win disciples, it would say, in the way the world thinks things should be done. But, my friends, this represents the truth of what I believe this passage is teaching. Men and women who respond to the plain truth of the gospel in this way immediately begin preparing themselves for the persecution that might come and they also avoid the risk of responding to a false gospel which appeals maybe to promises of health and wealth and ever-increasing prosperity which then when persecution comes along they lose their faith completely. 
The danger facing the modern church, I believe, is we emasculate this message of the grace and power of God, reducing the saving power of God to just some flimsy, dodgy advice and false promises. My point is this, Jesus doesn't pull any punches here. He tells us straight up, there's trouble out there and if you follow me, you're going to face opposition. I'd like to close with an illustration. A friend of mine I grew up with, I'll name him, I'm sure he won't mind. He was a member of a local diving club when I lived in Ireland over 30 years ago, a sub-aqua club, and he was called Aidan McLarnan. And he told me what happened to him on one of his first shipwreck dives. Now, I can't remember if it was his first wreck dive, and it's what happened to him, or whether it happened when he accompanied another person on their first shipwreck dive. But what I do remember is he told me that he found his way into a room in a submerged ship. But having entered this large room, he lost his bearings and he couldn't find his way out. And as he circled the four walls of the space looking for a way out, he kicked up more and more silt and his visibility kept reducing and he couldn't find the door. He couldn't find his exit. And he began to panic more and more, which only made matters worse because as his breathing increased and it got so rapid, he realized that he was using up his oxygen far more quickly than he should have and that he was in fact running out of time. He hadn't got enough, he almost had run out of time to allow himself enough time to exit the ship and get to the surface safely. When he realised that he had only a couple of minutes or so of spare time left, he said he almost had the urge to give up. So he tried to gather his emotions and he paused for a minute and he tried to count slowly up to ten and back again and try to think clearly about his predicament. As he did that, the silt began to settle and he noticed the directions of the bubble rising to the surface. And in an instant, the position of where he was in the room came back to him. He says it was almost as if his mind switched and recalibrated his position in the room. You see, in the panic, the mental map of the space that he was in had been totally reconfigured in his mind. And he realised that in his panic, he'd been going round the four walls, floor ceiling, wall floor, floor ceiling, wall floor, over and over again. He then calmly exited the door and made his way back to the surface with less than a minute to spare. I think that's a perfect picture of where we can get to in the midst of opposition, persecution, or maybe even just a panic attack. We get into the thick of the moment, the thick of the battle, and it can feel personal, and it can feel emotional, and if it comes from your friends and your family, or maybe even your religious connection, then you can get lost in the fog of war, so to speak. But Jesus here says, stop, pause, do not be afraid. I've already told you this was dangerous and that trouble like this would come. Thereby, focus on me, trust in me. The dust will settle, the path will become clear and you will find your way through. Don't be afraid, Jesus tells us, because I am with you and by the way, this is a great opportunity for you to depend on me also. You see, that's the whole point of this passage, friends. Don't miss the main point. Opposition is an opportunity to depend on God and to witness for Christ and the power of God. We have the help of the Holy Spirit who in that very moment can allow us to say yes to that challenge. You know, Christ, in a sense, draws a line in the sand and says on one side of that line lies a life of toil and hard work, a life which also means you will face opposition and maybe even discrimination and persecution. On this side of the line lies just the hollow pleasures of an ordinary life. And he says, the line is there. Let each and every individual man and woman choose their path and step over that line or otherwise. For my part, I made a decision to step over that line many, many years ago and in a sense take the same journey as those first 12 disciples did 2,000 years ago. You know, there is opposition out there, but there is a line on the sand and on one side is the challenge of the life of a disciple facing opposition 
but also with each step you take you have the promise and blessings of God that he will be there with you and that ultimately you have a secure place in heaven with a crown of life. I don't know about you, but I still today choose to step across that line and to follow him. And I trust you do also. <laughs>